I just wanted to first just a very short welcome just to say my name is Renee Monroe and I'm the Chief Development Officer for the Charles Darwin Foundation. I'm based in New York, um, upstate New York, and we decided amongst our team at CDF that it would be great to be able to bring Galapagos in some of our science projects to um, our supporters and friends for Charles Darwin Foundation since at this moment in time no one can travel there. So I thank Denise very much for doing our first one on shark ecology and I'll turn it over to you um, to just so you can give a little background on um, <clears throat> what you've been doing for the Charles Darwin Foundation for close to two years and um, some of your work that you can share and then we'll open it up for questions. And we'll do these periodically throughout the year to invite people to learn a little more in depth about some of our science projects. So thank you, Denise. Thank you, Renee. So hello, everybody. My name is Denise Fierroarcos, as Renee was pointing out. So I am working with the Shark Ecology Project. Um, so today uh, we're just talking about a little bit of what we do here at the Shark Ecology Project. Uh, so first, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so I am a marine ecologist. I am from Guayaquil in Ecuador, where I'm actually currently um, staying due to the COVID-19 uh, emergency. Um, I did go to Australia uh, for university, where I also spent a number of years. Uh, I am very much a fan of sharks and dogs. I think they're both very nice and cuddly. And even though I'm an ecologist, I quite like uh, statistics and coding, which is very unusual, I guess, for biologists that we tend to be scared of the numbers <laughs> most of the time. And I'm well known because of my love of sports, particularly scuba diving, and as you can see, the color pink as well. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Charles Darwin Foundation, or the CDF, as we know it for short. So we have a number of projects, 12 of which are terrestrial. You can see some of them here. Maybe you have heard about the Galapagos Verde, uh, which is a restoration project, or even the Mangrove Fringe uh, Recovery Project, uh, which is one of the um, land bird species which is the most at risk on the planet. And we also have eight marine based projects, which includes ours, the uh, Sharks Ecology Project. And the mission of the CDF in general is to basically go out to the field so we can gather some data, analyze it, and present it to the Galapagos National Park Directorate in a way that they can use it so they can design uh, conservation strategies that are effective in conserving uh, both marine and terrestrial ecosystems in the Galapagos archipelago. So I'm just going to talk quickly about the Galapagos Marine Reserve. So I just wanted to show you this small video. Um, just basically because we're celebrating the World Ocean Day. So this is a nice way to see that the oceans cover about 70% of our planet. Um, and they provide a number of services, including actually half of the oxygen that we breathe in every day. So the Galapagos are just off the coast of South America. They're part of Ecuador. They're about a thousand kilometers away. They are of volcanic origins. Uh, they're formed by 13 large islands and about 100 islets and rocks. So from 1998, they have been protected by the Galapagos Marine Reserve. This is the largest marine reserve in Ecuador and one of the largest in South America still. This is a multiple use reserve. That means that we take into account uh, the different uses from different uh, people that live in the reserve. Uh, so if you want to go surfing, you can do so. If, even if you want to do fishing, as long as you don't do it at an um, industrial scale, you're allowed to do so. But about 8% of all the reserve is dedicated exclusively for conservation and the protection of uh, marine habitats. You may know the Galapagos because of their biodiversity, particularly uh, the endemic species, that is species that are only found in this part of the world. Um, so we have uh, some example here, it's like the marine iguanas that are found nowhere else. Um, just to give you an example, about 10% of reef fish species in the Galapagos are endemic. That is, they cannot be found anywhere else on the planet. Um, so they reserve is also very good at protecting our marine environments. So the photo that you are now seeing on the right 
is from Global Fishing Watch. Each dot represents a fishing vessel. And as you can see, most of the vessels are away from the reserve. Um, so the Galapagos is, Marine Reserve is doing a good job in protecting our species. But have you ever wondered why is it that the Galapagos has all this diversity and why, um, why the high levels of endemism? So I just want to go back to that first map that I was showing you before. So if you see on the western side, um, you see there's a darker areas there, that means deeper areas. And most of the central part of the archipelago is located on a fairly shallow platform. So this is important, this bathymetry together with currents. I'm just gonna show you this next picture. So this here is the chlorophyll. Um, so on the western side, we have the green, yellow, and red areas. That means there's a lot of chlorophyll. So the chlorophyll is this uh, compound that plants, like terrestrial plants, use to produce photosynthesis, photosynthesize. Um, it is something similar in these microscopic organisms known as uh, phytoplankton in marine systems, they basically do the same. So we use the chlorophyll levels as a proxy or a way to indicate that there's a lot of life in that area. So if you remember from the previous map, uh, the western areas where there are deeper uh, areas, there's also where a lot of the chlorophyll is concentrating. And this is because we have this current that is coming from the west, very deep, and it crashes against that deep area, so it pushes the water up. And because it has a lot of nutrients, um, it allows all these phytoplankton to grow there. We also have some other currents from the other side, on the eastern side of the Galapagos, uh, the South Equatorial Current, which is influenced by two more currents, the Panama and the Humboldt Current. The Panama is very warm, it doesn't have as many nutrients, but the Humboldt does have a lot of nutrients similar to the uh, equatorial undercurrent or the crumble current. And this is why we also have on the southeastern part of the archipelago, we also have a fair bit of um, growth in there. So now sharks. So what are sharks to begin with? So they are fish, just like any other fish. The difference is that their skeletons are made out of cartilage. Uh, they have several rows of teeth and they have gill slits. Uh, that are not covered like we usually find in fish. So they've been around for a very long time, over 400 million years ago, they first appeared. And currently we have over 500 species uh, that are still around in the oceans. And because of all this diversity, sharks are not all the same. So they don't all look like bruise from jaws. So they are not all carnivores or gigantic. We actually have a variety in sizes, we can find sharks as small as 15 centimeters, like the pygmy lantern shark, which is a deep water shark, all the way up to the whale shark, which is the largest fish that can measure up to 18, even 20 meters long. Uh, like I said, they are all, all carnivores. Some of them are herb um, sorry, planktivores, as the whale sharks, and some of them are omnivores, like us. So they do eat meat, but they also eat seagrasses, like in the case of the bonnet head uh, shark, which is like a cousin, we should say, uh, of the hammerheads that we find in the Galapagos. And because of all this variety, sharks are able to occupy a lot of different areas around the world, from the tropics all the way to um, the poles, and from very shallow environments all the way to um, deep oceans. But why should we care about sharks in the first place? So there are two main reasons, I guess. Uh, the first one is that they are ecologically important. They are considered keystone species because they have a lot of influence on what happens in the environment in general. So because most sharks tend to be on the top of the food web, they eat all the animals that are below them in the food web. So they tend to eat animals that are called mesopredators, are in the middle. So they're predators still, they're carnivores, but they're not as high up as in, um, in the food web as the sharks are. 
So they control the numbers, and in turn, these mesoprotists control someone else's numbers, so in this case, the herbivores. Um, so if we take the sharks out, for example, the mesoprotists, the middle ones, they, no one is controlling their numbers, so they start eating too many herbivores, and there's no one left to eat uh, macroalgae, for example. So in areas where you have a lot of uh, corals, uh, if microalgae starts growing and no one controls it, then it is more the coral and it can't uh, grow anymore and sometimes it may die. Um, and another thing that the sharks do is that by regulating the numbers, uh, they usually target the animals that are, I guess, uh, a little bit sick, a little bit old, um, so that because, you know, even if we think of them as these really incredible predators, they tend to be a little bit lazy, so they prefer to go for easier prey. So they allow to keep all these uh, populations of fish um, a little bit healthier. And they're also economically important. So I'm just going to give you an example from the Galapagos. Uh, they keep employed about over, actually over a third of all people in the Galapagos. And in 2015, we did a study about how much they contribute to the local economy. And we found that because a lot of people go to, especially to Darwin and Wolf, the northern islands of the Galapagos, uh, to go and dive with them, they spend a lot of money because it's a remote area, they contribute about $360,000. Uh, that's per shark per year, uh, which over the lifetime is about $5.4 million. Um, so if we compare that to what you can get for, let's say, their fins, which is about $200 or $260 in the mainland, it is a significant difference. So it is not only worth uh, keeping the sharks alive because they are ecologically important, but also because they contribute a lot to our economy. So you may have heard that sharks are in a bit of trouble. Um, the main reason is because humans are putting pressures on them, uh, mostly through overfishing um, on purpose for their fins or as bycatch when uh, other species are targeted. Climate change is also affecting them, pollution and the loss of key habitats. So there are some species like the hammerheads, for example, that they use uh, mangrove areas when they're very young. Um, basically, when they are newborns, uh, they are very vulnerable uh, to be basically consumed by other sharks. So they use the mangrove roots to protect themselves and they have a lot of food available in that area as well. So if we uh, go down those areas, these sharks won't have anywhere to go and grow during that initial stages and that affects them later. Uh, so the life cycle as well, it exacerbates the problem because they are species that tend to grow very slowly. Um, they mature late as well, they reproduce late, and they have a uh, low number of pups. Uh, so all these combined does not allow uh, for shark populations to withstand that um, pressure from overexploitation. So what do we do at the Shark Ecology Project? So basically, we are trying to understand what is happening with different uh, species of shark within the Galapagos Marine Reserve. We want to understand if El Nino cycles will have an impact on their populations, how the population is doing, how they distribute themselves, um, so we can identify key areas that we should protect. Uh, if they uh, different populations connect to each other, um, not only within the Galapagos, but within this wider deep region that is called the Tropical Eastern Pacific, which I'm going to show you a map of right now. So the Tropical Eastern Pacific, as its name said, is on the eastern side of the Pacific Basin, that it includes uh, most of the coasts of uh, uh, Central and, and Northern South America. Uh, and includes uh, five oceanic um, islands, including the Galapagos, Clipperton, and Cocos, which you may have heard of. And we also have an education and outreach arm 
uh, that is trying to educate people about the importance of uh, having sharks in our ecosystems. So the species that we study, uh, it's mainly these six that you are seeing on your screen now, including the hammerheads, the Galapagos sharks, tiger, the white and black tips, and the silky sharks. And that's mainly because they are the most common ones in the reserve, so it is a lot easier to study them. Uh, but we do uh, study the entire assemblage or the, the different species that make up the populations of sharks in the Galapagos. So how do we do this? We use a variety of techniques. Uh, so we tend to use a lot of the stereo video cameras, which are on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, so sometimes we take it uh, when, while we're diving, they are known as doves. Sometimes we just leave them in the sea floor. That's when they are known as props and they usually have some bait to attract uh, uh, not only sharks, but the carnivores in general. We use uh, tags, so satellite tags, which work similar to your phone. So it tells us roughly what, where the shark was heading to every time that the fin comes out of the water surface. We also use acoustic tags. So these ones are different from the satellite tags because they don't tell us where the shark were, um, but rather if the shark was in a particular area. So we have these receptors, which is the, um, the first picture on the right hand side, on the uh, bottom right hand side, that's the receptor. We keep it in an area in particular. And when a shark with a tag comes around, it will let us know if there was a shark uh, there, which shark it was, and at what time it was, and what day. And we usually uh, do free diving uh, to tag the sharks. But sometimes we have to actually fish the sharks get them close to a boat uh, so we can put these satellite tags or acoustic tags. So this is a photo of some work that we did um, about mid last year with a tiger shark. It was a really nice one too. So I'm just gonna share some of our findings so far. So this was done in 2015. Uh, we used those uh, uh, cameras that I was telling you about with the bait. So we put them all over the archipelago um, and we were trying to find out the species of sharks that we have in the reserve and how many of them do we, ha we have in the reserve. So what we found that was that we have 10 different species of sharks. Uh, the six that I mentioned before, the hammerhead, uh, the, the white and black tip, they were all the most common species in the marine reserve and about 85% of all shark sightings were of those species. Um, but as a whole, sharks only represent about 1% of all the fishes that we saw in these videos. And what we found as well is that the sharks didn't distribute themselves evenly across the reserve, but rather that in the central part, so Santa Cruz Island, which is where uh, the CDF, the Charles Tower Foundation, is based. Uh, Daphne Islands, that's where most of the diversity of sharks was found. Uh, while the northern islands of Barron and Wolf, that is located about 100 and so kilometers from Santa Cruz, uh, that's where most of the abundance of the uh, biggest numbers of sharks was found. So with this in mind, uh, the next time we headed to Darwin and Wolf, uh, just to quantify exactly how much uh, biomass or how much the, the weight of the sharks in that area was in comparison to other areas. So this is a nice video graph that we got at the end of all that work. Uh, so essentially what the bars are saying is that the black areas is all fish in general, uh, except for sharks and the red uh, part of that bar represents all the apex predators, which are mostly sharks, all sharks actually. Uh, so what we find is that Darwin and Wolf, DNW is the first uh, bar in here. Uh, it has the highest biomass of sharks in comparison to other oceanic islands around the planet. So it seems like the sharks do love to be inside the Galapagos Marine Reserve. Then we wanted to concentrate a little bit more on a particular species. So we look at the tiger sharks. 
Uh, so we use those satellite tags that I was telling you about before, and we use also some acoustic tags just to see where the sharks were um, um, heading around. So we tag sharks in Santa Cruz Island and also in Isabella Island. And using these, uh, these locations that we got from the satellite, we found that the areas that they use the most overlap with areas where green sea turtles go nesting. And we also did some diet analysis uh, just to see what the sharks ate. And I'm sure you probably uh, guessed by now, uh, these sharks, particularly large sharks, so over two and a half meters long, uh, the favorite thing for them to eat was these green sea turtles. So they overlap nicely, as you can see. So the red areas in there are the areas with the highest concentration. Uh, the orange is the middle one and the yellow is the uh, smallest concentration. And what we also found as well is that unlike many other places around the planet, um, the tiger sharks here, they tend to stay in the same area. So if we tag the sharks in Isabella, we find them mostly around Isabella. Uh, the ones attack in Santa Cruz were fine mostly around Santa Cruz and only two out of about 40 sharks that we tagged for this study actually left the reserve but they both came back uh, but most of them they were just basically hanging around those same areas so we found that tiger sharks are primary residents here in the Galapagos Marine Reserve. And we also have some near registers. Um, so we include some cousins of the sharks, the rays. Uh, so on the top left, for example, we have uh, deep scale, uh, Bathyraja apicicola. Um, just below it, we have a seven gill shark. It's the very first time that we have seen uh, this type of shark here in the Galapagos. And this was actually captured by a camera that was studying uh, lampreys uh, from some other project that we have uh, visiting the islands. Uh, and we also have this uh, white fin smooth hound uh, that was also seen um, while well, some visiting scientists came here to do some uh, stereo video camera drops. And we have some new type of manta ray as well. This will be published soon, by the way. And I also wanted to mention quickly our outreach and education arm. So like I was saying before, we really want to um, let the public know uh, why the sharks are important uh, for local ecosystems and for the local community as well. Uh, so we created this program called the Sharks Ambassador in 2017 which is aimed at high school students. Uh, the idea is to uh, basically open up opportunities for them to an experience what it's like to be a scientist uh, by uh, giving them lectures, uh, opening up opportunities for them to go on the field, um, or sometimes even allowing them to participate in activism. Uh, so I don't have a copy of the video here, but I'm just gonna share um, a link. Uh, so recently, uh, our communications department, for example, uh, they got the sharks ambassadors together to present a video about uh, the shark fins that were caught in Hong Kong uh, about a month ago. Uh, so the the shark ambassadors are um, asking our, our representative to. Uh, change the law so we can protect the sharks uh, because they're important for local ecosystems are, and ourselves, the community. So now I just wanted to talk quickly about how this emergency has affected us. To be quite honest, um, the main thing or the only bad thing that has happened to us is that we are not able to go on the field and gather some data. But we do still have a lot of data uh, that we still have to go through, which is fine by me because I love doing that sort of thing. So we can continue doing data analysis, we can continue writing scientific publications, uh, which I'm gonna show you an example of what we're doing in a second as well. Um, 
as I mentioned before, we're working with the communications and education teams to design our rich campaigns. Uh, so these, uh, which was nicely organized by the communications team is uh, part of this uh, uh, education campaign. And we also have opportunities to um, develop ourselves professionally. So not only the staff, but also the volunteers are able to access online courses uh, and we can develop skills that uh, we don't often have the opportunity to do uh, while we're working. So I just wanted to show you uh, what one of the examples of the things that we're doing now. So we are trying to track uh, the movement of the hammerheads. So we use a tab type of satellite tag um, that doesn't quite tell us exactly where the sharks were. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but we roughly got a track of what these sharks were. So the idea was that we were tagging these uh, retina-looking uh, female hammerheads in northern Galapagos um, in uh, Darwin Island uh, because we wanted to know where they go and give birth. Uh, because in the Galapagos, even though we have a lot of pregnant females, we don't often see very young uh, hammerheads. So there has been areas where we think that they may using as nurses they're called when there's a lot of young, uh, but not enough. But we do know that along the coast of the Americas, uh, mangroves were, are being used as nursery areas for, uh, by hammerhead sharks. So the idea was to uh, check if these females from the Galapagos will go to uh, the mainland of the Americas to uh, give birth to those pups. So we're doing this together with some uh, collaborators from Nova Southeastern University. And we're also hopefully looking at um, the diving pattern of these sharks. Uh, we haven't really looked too much into detail in this, but what we found is that these sharks tend to dive very deep, uh, often to 800 meters and sometimes as deep as to 1,000 meters. We still don't know why they do this. Uh, it might be likely because they're finding, uh, trying to find food, but you know, this is still under study. So that's it for me. Uh, this, all this work has been possible, of course, because of the help of our donors, which are uh, pictured here, particularly uh, these ones here that um, they support our Sharks Ecology Project directly. Uh, we thank them very much for allowing us to continue our work. And I'm just going to take some questions now. So if anyone has any questions at all, you can raise your hand and I can uh, um, unmute you. Or if you prefer, you can just type in your question and I'll answer it for you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to check the people who raise their hands. So we go with, uh, I'm so sorry if I'm not pronouncing the name correctly, but I'm just going to go with uh, Babette Ei. Hello there. Hello, Denise. Hi, hi this is Renee. Renee. Hi, hi, hi. Um, I can't see if there are questions now because the raise hand thing isn't working quite right, but does anybody have any questions for Denise um, and the Charles Darwin Shark Program or how to get more involved or if you'd like more information? I do have some raise hands, but I'm not able to unmute them, it seems. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so I have Babette. I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and ask me your question. Okay, maybe we can try again. No, it doesn't. Okay, I'm just going to go with Michael. Hi, I don't, can you hear me now? Yes, hi, Michael. Hi, I just wanted to ask um, how many sharks have actually been tagged in the islands overall? Uh, so we have about 40 tiger sharks that we tag uh, with uh, satellite and um, acoustic tags. And we have an extra, we have about 25 sharks uh, hammerhead sharks that we tagged in the last 
three to four years as well. Uh, so this, those two species are the one that we are concentrating on at the moment. Thank you. You're welcome. So we have Lisa here. Sorry, it seems like I kind of mute some of you. So I have Peter now. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, hi, Peter. Hi. Thank you very much. It was very, very interesting and congratulations on your work. Thank um, you. I have, a question. I have a question concerning the 37% um, of, of income that uh, is of, of all tourist income, if I understood it correctly, but maybe you can explain that a bit. That mm -hmm. is due to shark tourism, which seems a lot. I'm sure it, it has a good basis, but does that mean that, um, it certainly doesn't mean that 30% of all tourists coming to Galapagos go and see and dive for sharks. It must be much less than that. Do they spend a lot more money or is it that the money they spend is spent mainly on Galapagos while many other people who come to Galapagos spend much of their money to companies that are not based on Galapagos. What is, how, do, how does this, uh, what's the basis of those 70, uh, no, 37% if you can explain? Yes, so 37% uh, of people of working age are um, basically in a job because of marine based tourism in general. Um, so not yeah. specifically sharks but marine okay. tourism in general, yes. Uh, but the figure that I gave, that is about 5.4 million per year, that is the contribution as an average that every shark, um, it, that every shark contributes to the local economy uh, over the lifetime. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, that's interesting. Good, I mean, it's of course theoretical, but it's, uh, it's in communication terms, it's an interesting figure to call. Yes. I Thank can you. share with you, uh, so we do have a report, so if you can uh, send me your details. Uh, so I'm just going to put up my email in there again. Uh, so if you want to email me, I can send you the report as well. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, You're please. welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. So we've had Hans. Hi. Hi. How are you? Hello, Hans. Yeah. Uh, no, it was very interesting. Uh, but I, um, I, um, having said that, I had exactly the same question as Peter Kramer, whom I greet from uh, here in mm -hmm. uh, Maastricht, um, um, about yes, the the economic um, impact of um, sharks, and mm -hmm. I now understand that that is marine life in general. Am I right? Yes, marine-based tourism in general. So if you go out. Uh, on a boat, basically. Um, that's kind of marine tourism in general. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we have Anna. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Um, yeah, my question is, um, do you know or um, whether the sharks are affected by the text because of their electrosensation? Are affected by, sorry, but what? Um, by the tags that you put on them. Oh, the tags. Yeah. Uh, as far as uh, we know, uh, there is no effect uh, on their electroreceptors. Um, there is no research showing that it has affected them in any way. Uh, what does happen is that these tags, sometimes they produce drag. Uh, so if they are too heavy, for example, it might um, disturb the way the sharks swim, and that's why the tags tend to be quite small. Um, so the tags that we were showing you were about the size of a mobile phone, maybe, and the sharks that we usually put these tags on, they are, you know, over two meters long, so it doesn't really affect them. Uh, so usually that's the concern. It's more like, you know, will it, uh, the tax affect their swimming ability, uh, but not so much the electroreceptor. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So I have a question here on the chat. 
Ah, it says the number of fishing boats on the western side of Isabella affects food supply for sharks. Um, to be honest, I do not know the answer uh, to that question. Um, but I will assume if it's done uh, indiscriminately, uh, it will eventually affect um, the sharks. Uh, but I don't think we have done a, uh, a study that in particular. So do we have any more questions at all? I don't know if Renee wants to add uh, anything. Yes. Yeah, Denise, um, th I just want to say thank you so much. It's really informative and interesting. And to everybody who's on the call, if you have any follow-up questions, please direct them to me and uh, Lisa Nagode too, and Denise, and we will get back to you one-on-one -on -one with any specific questions you have. But we'll also try to post some of this information on our website, and we'll do these periodically on various topics. But we really want to hear from you and your interests and any questions you have. Um, so that we keep in close contact, especially during this time when we can't have visitors quite yet, but soon hopefully um, come back to Galapagos. But um, I thank everybody for calling in for this, um, and Denise, especially for you preparing the information to share with everyone about our shark program. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, as I said, if anyone has any questions, uh, they would like any additional information about what I'm setting here, you can email me. Uh, I think you can see my screen right now. That's my email address. So you can email me anytime. Thank you so much, Denise. Thank and you. And thank you, everybody, for calling in. Bye. Bye-bye.